I have the pleasure today to introduce Marisa Crow. She's the Finley Distinguished Professor at Missouri University, sorry, Missouri University of Science and Technology, which is in Rolla, so it's formerly a University of Missouri Rolla, yep. right? Just so you're familiar with the name. Uh, she's the director of the Research and Development Center at the University, former dean of the School of Materials Energy and Earth Sciences. Her PhD is from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, she's a fellow of IEEE, plus many other awards that I'm not going to go into. Thank you for being well, here. Thank you. Well, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to give kind of a general overview. I asked what the audience would be, and I was told to, you know, start with something relatively general, so no big, long equations. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit towards the end, um, if we have time, about some of the actual research that I've been doing uh, in the microgrid area. Now, I call this future electric energy systems. You may have heard the word smart grid a lot. Now, I personally take great offense to the name smart grid because that means that the last 25 years of my life I've been working on the dumb grid, which I would not like to fix. But anyway, you may it referred to as the smart grid, and that's okay. So really, in order to understand where we are today and what has really uh, driven this whole concept of the future, uh, future grid, we have to understand how we use electricity and how we use energy here in the United States. Um, so this is back from 2011, and of course this is the most recent information that you can find because these things are always a little bit dated. But if you look on the left-hand side, that tells you where our resources come from, where we use energy from. So coal is about a quarter of our resources. Um, we have natural gas, which is also roughly about a quarter. And you can look as we go down, crude oil, um, nuclear power, um, petroleum, and renewable energy. That renewable energy bit is, is starting to grow, unfortunately enough. At, at not quite the rate that we would like it to, and things such as coal and natural gas are decreasing, not necessarily in terms of bulk usage, but as a percent of our overall energy usage. Because remember, our overall energy usage uh, continues to increase. And then there at the bottom we have our petroleum, um, which is really the energy resource that we would like to, as, as a country, move away from. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is has been driven in many in many cases about trying to move from from this petroleum base because we we import most of our petroleum um, from you know the Middle East and, and other places um, increasingly amounts from South America perhaps Russia uh, but in terms of our own um, use of petroleum we're trying to move away from that now here on the right hand side is where we use that energy. Um, and this is roughly, you know, 25% all the way down. So we use um, just under 25% in terms of residential. That would be our homes, uh, home heating, home cooling, home usage in terms of electricity appliances. Um, the next sector there is commercial. Uh, that would be things such as, as malls, businesses, um, non-manufacturing industries. Uh, also things such as schools, hospitals, things of that nature would fall under there. Industrial is the next one. That one has actually increased, believe it or not, a little bit. Um, and that would be manufacturing uh, of, of goods and, and services. And then the last one is transportation. So about 25, a little over 25% of our energy usage in the United States goes to transportation. And that's not just personal transportation, that also includes uh, shipping transportation and things like that. Now one thing I always like to do is kind of a visual draw across. If you look at the petroleum line and you just draw it across, of course, you know, it's almost a one-to-one -one match to transportation. And that indeed is where most of our ener petroleum energy uses goes into transportation. So as we try and decrease the amount of petroleum, our transportation energy use is probably not going to decrease. We are still going to have to have personal transportation. We're still going to have to have uh, shipping transportation and things like that. But what we're going to have to do is use other energy resources for that transportation sector. And so that is also going to feed into how we look at electricity in the future. Now, 
one thing that we're talking about also in, in terms of, of petroleum is this is a very telling um, uh, graphic here on our U.S. petroleum. So as you can see, our production, you know, peaked back in the 1970s. Um, some of you are probably too young to remember, but that, that was back in the Carter era. Um, and then since then, it has been decreasing, whereas our import of petroleum has, has really significantly increased. So over 65% of, of known U.S. oil has been extracted. Now, there has been, of course, a big push to go into deep water drilling offshore, um, and that has been able to increase our um, expanse beyond, you know, the, the known area of, of the U.S., but once again, um, we can only go so far with that as well. So, to put that in perspective, nice another little visual, if you consider our oil as a six-pack, we have now gone through four of our six cans of soda. I also have a, a nice little visualization that has beer, but I tend not to show that at the universities. So what this tells us, I mean this puts it in perspective, so two-thirds are gone, but we still have one-third left. So we're not necessarily in panic mode, but we are in the time, thank you, where we need to start thinking about um, how we need to essentially wean ourselves off of petroleum and into other kinds of energy. So now let's talk about it. Yes? So when you mentioned two-thirds are gone, is that gone for a global resolution? Or something we already know? Or some, just in a specific region? In the United States. The United so States. that says known U.S. oil reserves. So we have so there may be oil reserves out there that we don't know about, which could change this. But we have tapped, you know, over two thirds of our known, known oil reserves in it. From what I heard, actually, the purpose of preserve all things, we didn't really do it out than use it in the U.S. It's just a wonder. Well, I guess it depends on where you pull your graphics from. This is from the DOE website, and so um, there are always going to be. I mean, there and. And when we talk about oil, we have to talk about easy oil versus hard oil. Um, you know, there is tar sands, for example. Canada has a lot of tar sands, which, you know, tar is a petroleum project. It's in the sand, and so you have to extract it. It's there. We know about it. But is it so easy to extract out? Same thing with, you know, with deep water oil. We know it's there, but... But is it cost effective? <clears throat> so, you know, in other words, we might say this is, oh, we have used over 65% of the easily obtainable cost effective oil reserves as well. There's always going to be this trade off. So, this doesn't include like shale oil and, and other things? This does include shale oil. That's and easy all oil? Relative. Shale oil is medium oil, I would say. They are starting to extract shale oil to a much greater extent. The Canadians are really leading the way on this. Um, the United States does not have so many shale oil reserves, also called heavy oil, um, but there are some. Actually, Missouri has, has shale oil. Um, once again, that depends on the geography of the land um, and how we extract it. Um, traditional extraction methods don't work for shale oil, um, so you have to use different kinds of technologies. And so actually in the petroleum sector, they are looking at, at some of these others, but, but they're really not as cost effective. For example, you know, back in the 70s, um, there was a lot of oil production out of, say, North Dakota. Um, that oil is still there. It's just it's no longer cost efficient. It, it's much cheaper actually to import it from the Middle East than it is to extract our own, our own domestic oil at this point. So there's always that trade off. Okay, so let's talk about electricity. I'm an electrical engineer. I like to talk about electricity. I'm a power engineer. Um, I have been traditionally, all my degrees are in the power engineering se sector of electrical engineering. The cost of electricity. I know we all like to complain about our electricity bills, but typically what is causing your electrical bills to go up is your use. Um, certainly our electrical usage is continuing to go uh, up as we buy more and more appliances. We are 
and affluent society. We like our toys. Um, in the big scheme of things, our cost of electricity has remained relatively constant. Uh, it has gone up slightly, but, but not a whole lot. And it goes up and down depending on a lot of political factors. Um, but this is a nice little graphic here that talks about the cost of electricity um, by sector. So for example, industrial uh, is here, residential. You can see that you know, the residential is the most expensive. They charge us the most for it because we are not bulk users. The bulk users are the industrial and they can usually um, get cheaper prices because they're buying at the wholesale market as opposed to the end market. Well, kind of what's interesting right here is transportation. So electricity for transportation has, um, has started to now be considered or recognized as its own sector. This is not so much necessarily uh, residential or, or personal vehicles, but this is um, typically fleet vehicles that are now starting to be electrified and also mass transportation, which is electrified. This is also a nice little graphic for us to think about. Okay, the United States average is 11 and a half cents per kilowatt hour. This is the residential average price. So this is what we as homeowners or, or renters would pay. Industrial and commercial, of course, is very different, um, but it typically follows the same trends. So California, you're out here, so you are over 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Missouri, which is where I'm from, is one of the cheapest ones at, at 9 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, this, this region right in through here, what, what is specific about that region? The light blue region, why is there so cheap? Well, let's think, what about the, uh, the Northwest? What do they have? Hydro. What does Kentucky and West Virginia have? Coal. Coal. <laughs> Same thing with Nebraska, Wyoming. So what we're seeing right in through here is the coal belt, and of course this is hydro. And so that's why electricity there is so, so very cheap. Um, and that, that, that brings up some issues uh, as we continue to talk about things about the implementation of smart grid. The first adopters of the smart grid are going to be California and the, uh, the Northeast, because that's where the cost of electricity is the most expensive. Places like the Midwest, where it's dirt cheap, for example, in Missouri, 85% um, of our electricity comes from coal and nuclear, uh, we're going to be some of the last adopters, because there's no reason for us to be flexible and, and have demand response when everything is so cheap anyway. Um, Cost of electricity, I've, I've been involved in a project with the Department of Energy about electrification of Alaska. And part of the reason their electricity is so expensive is transportation. Right? What we're seeing right there is transportation costs to get anything um, there. Now part of the reason California is so expensive is why? Regulations, right? You guys could burn coal. I mean, you're not that far from Wyoming, you're about as close as we are, but you guys don't have any coal burning plants, by policy. Okay, so where does our electricity come from? Coal. We are the Middle East of coal. Um, we talked to some people, we have hundreds of years of coal reserves ready and available. It's not something we're going to get away from anytime in the near future. Um, it is a finite resource. We are going to run out of it at some point. Um, the biggest drawback to coal is, of course, pollution. So I think that we're going to see more clean coal technologies. Um, in fact, I was just at a talk yesterday where they were talking about um, uses of fly ash and particulates, and actually using fly ash, which is one of the waste products um, that comes out of the stack, in coal can actually make stronger concrete than our typical aggregates that we use right now. And actually California is one of the largest importers. You guys don't have coal plants, but you guys import a lot of fly ash for concrete. So it's kind of an interesting thing, which if we didn't have coal plants, you guys wouldn't have your fly ash. Um, so there are many good byproducts 
from coal plants, um, especially you know, for transportation and <coughs> infrastructure products, building, um, for example. We can see nuclear power is continuing to go up, but it has leveled off, unfortunately, there, I think, in the last decade or so. Natural gas is continuing to go up as we see more and more reserves being found. Petroleum, you can see for electricity generation, has, has pretty much remained constant. And, oh, sorry, that's, that's the renewable energy. The petroleum has continually gone down, which I think is a good, good trend. But renewable energy here, you know, we see that big drop off there in coal. I think that's the whole the global warming or climate change um, discussion has decreased the coal, at least for a very short period of time, with Al Gore and his his uh, his push right there. But it's now going to go back up as people, you know, just popular. You know, it's not in the public eye. It's going to go away. But one thing that I would like to see is I'd like to see this renewable energy uh, continue to go up. So what this tells us is there is a portfolio, a portfolio of resources. And so when we talk about smart grid, when we talk about clean energy, when we talk about you know, energy crisis, or anything else you want to look at in terms of electricity, uh, we have to look at this in terms of a portfolio. There is no one silver bullet. And we are not going to get rid of coal anytime in the near future. Uh, even if we were to increase double the amount of renewable energy that we have, you know, that, that is not going to offset the amount of coal that we use. So what we need to do is we need to come up with a plan, a long-term energy plan, which unfortunately our youth country does not have, um, of what we see going forward of our electricity usage. Okay, this is just another graphic pie chart that says exactly the same thing. In 2011, um, this is what we look like coal, here natural gas, nuclear, hydroelectric, which is considered a renewable resource. So if you go back and you actually look at that, um, where it says renewables, that, that includes hydro. So that is not just wind and solar, that is hydro, that is biomass. Um, and then other renewables, 5% petroleum, so on and so forth. This sector is decreasing, but, uh, but not to the extent that you might expect. What I would like to see, personally, um, I would like to see the nuclear proportion become larger. I really think that as we look forward into the future, nuclear has to be part of the game that we talk about. Um, but unfortunately, recent events have, have made people, once again, more leery of, of nuclear power. Okay, so once again, I said, you know, our known coal reserves, as opposed to petroleum, which has been decreasing, our known coal reserves are continuing to, to go up. And actually, we know more coal available now than we even had back. We just keep finding it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we use electricity. So in order to understand what the whole smart grid thing means, we have to understand how electricity is used. So right now we have our generation. Um, typically, what we have had up to this point are large plants. The larger, the better. You know, gigawatts. And then that is produced, usually someplace out in the middle of nowhere, um, unless it's hydro. Um, and then that is brought in via a transmission line, typically high voltage. Um, in our country, we go up to 765 kV. Um, and that's mostly out here in the west and some, some quarters on the east coast. Um, but most of them are about 345, 138 kV. Uh, China has actually gone to 1000 kV um, for large amounts of power transfer. Obviously, you want to go to much higher voltages so that you can have lower currents and less losses in the system. Then we come down to a substation where the voltages then step down and we can feed you know, large customers. Um, or we can go to another substation, step it down even further into typically residential use. Okay, today's electricity system is 99.97% reliable. I mean, that's, that's a really good deal, but the implications um, are, are costly to that. 
and interruptions are becoming more prevalent as well. Um, power outages cost Americans roughly $150 billion each year. That's about $500 for every person in the United States from power outages. And these can be, you know, user outages, um, but typically they come from natural events. Lightning, wind, tornadoes, you know, hurricanes, things of that nature. But if you think about what else do you have in your life that you rely upon that is 99.97% reliable? Is your car that reliable? Well, airplanes perhaps are that reliable, but is air service that reliable? <laughs> Mine certainly wasn't last night. Um, you know, are your computers, your laptops, your cell phone, you know, are those things that reliable? Yeah. And, and for that reason, that has structured how we use electricity as a society. It is a <coughs> regulated um, commodity. And the reason it is regulated is because, essentially, we, we rely on it. Um, everyone has to use it. So the cost is regulated. The service itself is regulated. It's one of the few regulated monopolies that is still left. Now, that, of course, is changing to some extent. Um, I don't believe it will ever become a fully deregulated industry, but but certain portions of it are becoming increasingly deregulated. But it's going to have to be continued to be to be regulated because of that that reliability issue. So let's look about the impact. We said it's very expensive. Let's look at the impact of one hour of power interruption. So here's the industries. There's the amounts. So cellular communications, one hour of interruption is forty-one thousand dollars. Telephone ticket sales, this is not so much telephone ticket sales anymore as internet ticket sales. 72,000 airline reservation systems, once again that's an internet thing, um, use power to a server, you know things go down. Semiconductor manufacturers, if you have a glitch in your semiconductor manufacturing process, you have to send, you have to, the whole batch is just lost. Credit cards, brokerage, that's Wall Street. What do we notice about all of these, with the exception of semiconductor manufacturers? It's the loss of the ability to make a sale. Only in semiconductor manufacturing is there an actual loss <coughs> of a product. Everything else, because we have built our economy on this, is the loss of the ability to make money. Uh -huh when we lose electricity. The U.S. accounts for 4% of the world's population, but we contribute 25% of the greenhouse gases. That's not really surprising. Um, we are an affluent society, and we are becoming more affluent. Um, you know, I even look back in, in my lifetime, you know, when I was a teenager, um, I did not have a car. If I wanted to go someplace, I broke my bike. Now, my teenagers have cars, and we have multiple TVs, and everybody has their own computer, and everybody has their own cell phone. We are becoming more and more fluent. We are using more and more energy, and an increasing amount of that energy is, is electricity. So we are contributing. But also, as an affluent society, we do become more concerned about the environment. We are concerned about the carbon dioxide that we're putting in the air. And we do read or, or hear about frequently, you know, with some of the developing countries, you know, they're polluting their air, they're polluting their water. And, and my response to that is we did that as a country. We did that 100 years ago in the Industrial Revolution. We spewed all kinds of stuff. And it's hard to tell someone to be concerned about the environment when they are concerned about putting food in their mouth and a roof over their heads. So as an affluent society, we can take the lead on this. Um, and we should be taking the rules because we can afford to do so. If the grid were just 5% more efficient, energy savings would equate, equate to permanently eliminating fuel and greenhouse gas emissions from 53 million cars. Just 5% more efficient. Right now, the transmission grid, if you actually look at a transmission line, the grid efficiencies are, are up in the 98%. 
for sense. I mean, with our high voltages, with the kinds of cables that we have, um, transformers are relatively very efficient. Uh, but they are still just hunks of metal. Uh, what is not so efficient is our generators. We lose a lot to heat. Um, even, even nuclear reactors. Um, a nuclear reactor is essentially the same thing as a coal reactor. A lot of people don't know this. Um, uh, coal is burned to make heat, to make steam. Nuclear reactors, the reaction is used to make steam. So that the, the end, um, the, the electricity producing end of both the coal plant and the nuclear plant are exactly the same. Um, if every American household replaced just one incandescent bulb with a compact fluorescent, we could save more than $600 million in Easy step, easy thing to do. We should have done it else. Okay, so that kind of frames where we currently are with respect to the United States and many of the other affluent countries, Canada, the Europeans. Um, so that brings us to what is the smart grid vision. So this is, now we are the same place. We have at our fingertips um, a whole portfolio of different energy resources. We have communication, we have control. Um, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to integrate all of these different resources that we have and use them to facilitate our green energy-based economy. We want to mitigate our growing energy crisis and we want to reduce the impact of carbon emissions. So we want to address both the energy issues and the environmental issues. So how are we going to do that? Well, I like to think about this as, um, you know, paradigm shift. I've talked to several of you this morning about, well, smart grid. What can we do uh, to be smart grid? And smart grid um, is going to bring in a lot more people with a lot more expertise than we have typically thought about in terms of the power engineering. I mean, in the past, power was just old, it was pumps of metal, and it wasn't really so very interesting. But now there have been a lot of things that have been going forward that makes the whole concept of smart grid a really exciting thing to think about. I think it would be very fun to be a young person at this time because the opportunities are just incredible at this point. So I like to draw analogies to, to really the internet. Um, you know, what we think about the smart grid as being is the energy <coughs> of the internet. So what do we mean by that? Well, back pre-1980s, when we talked about computing, when we talked about information, uh, we had these big centralized mainframes. You know, and they had to be in special rooms that had to have special environmental controls and, and things like that. But then we went to the internet. We allowed these large centralized processors of information to share that information via the internet. And now, because of that, we have extreme, to the extreme, distributed computing, where everybody owns it, everybody uses it, everybody shares all kinds of information. And so what that has enabled is really a whole sector. And it has changed the way we do business. Right? Uh, not even in terms of eBay, Google, and YouTube, but how we share information. It has impacted political, um, you know, in, in many countries, things like that. What made all of this possible? What one technological development? I heard someone say it. Integrated circuit. Integrated circuit, right. The transistor power, you know, so microelectronics. <laughs> uh, because that made, uh, made, my thing was dying. Um, smaller, faster, cheaper. Right, smaller, faster, cheaper. So now we can do that. And also, you know, if we think about, you know, just simply a laptop, so here I'm, I'm talking to you, my laptop is plugged in, I'm going to unplug my laptop. What happened? Nothing, right? Well, we think nothing, nothing externally. But inside, suddenly my computer went, woo, you know, and now it's going to switch over to its internal energy management system. 
right? And then I can go in actually and program when I want, you know, my, it could be max power, it could be max video, it could be max this, that, or the other thing. You all can do that. I actually have a little switch online which says I want to be, you know, maximum energy, maximum, you know, video or whatever. Um, also, I have over here, you know, these cables. I have my USB, right? So I can plug that in and I can share information. Um, I can also use my USB port to plug my coffee warmer in if I wanted to, or my little lava lamp, or any other things. So we have ways within this laptop of sharing energy, of sharing information. Um, you know, so, so it really goes down to the ubiquitous sharing. But it's ubiquitous sharing of information. Right? So let's think about how we can draw an analogy to this with electricity. Right? We have the electricity internet. So, same thing. We have this centralized generation. Right, it's far away, you know, there's, there's only so many ways you can get the electricity out. But now we're going to have this paradigm shift of the smart grid. What is making the smart grid possible? What technology? Yeah, well, not only IT, but when we talk about flexible using Photovoltaics using wind, using flexible electricity. We have power electronics, you know, and they are moving towards integrated circuits in terms of power electronics. That is, we can now talk about packet electricity, right? On top of the framework of all of our information technology, and so we are going to see. Just like we saw, you know, with ubiquitous sharing of information, now we're going to see ubiquitous sharing of electricity. And that's what we mean by this future electricity market. And so this, the same way that we have the internet drive all kinds of businesses, we're going to see this energy internet driving all kinds of new companies based on IT and power electronics technology. So if I were young at this point, you know, I would be thinking about what, what is the future going to look like? And I know some of you are. So one of the things that we can look at that's also driving this is advanced metering, prices to devices. Now one thing that many people may not recognize or realize is that the cost of electricity is not the same throughout the day. It changes, just like you know, if you want to go to a matinee movie. You know, it's cheaper in the middle of the day and more expensive at night. Or same thing with, you know, with buying your airline tickets. If you want to you wanna travel at peak times, it's going to be more expensive. Well, it's the same thing with electricity. Although, historically, we've always paid postage stamp, right? Just one cost. But what this is now going to enable us to do is have things such as demand response, where we can, through the use of two-way communication, Right now, we only have one-way communication. You know, it always goes one direction. But with two-way communication, we can get real-time pricing, and we can change our behavior to maximize our, or minimize our cost, maximize our usage. Because we don't want to use electricity during peak times. So if you look at this, is over 24 hours. So peak is when? <coughs> middle of the day, we're all at work, we have all the lights on, we have all our computers running, we have our air conditioner going full blast because it's a hot day, our coffee machines are all running, we're all using, you know, faxes and, and whatever. But then as people go home, towards the end of the day, we, we leave our offices, we turn off our lights, we turn off our computers, whatever, and then in the middle of the night, that's called base load, right? That's when we have, you know, traffic lights and alarm clocks is essentially the only thing that we have. So this is called demand factor, it is the difference between the peak demand and the base load. Right? And really what we want to do is we want to level that out. And we can do that by trying to shift some of this load that we have to off-peak times. And that requires 
communication, right? We have to be able to communicate what that real-time pricing is. And then we have to have um, a mechanism that if I change my electricity usage, that I get an incentive for doing that. I mean, because right now on my dishwasher at home, I have a little button that says four hour delay. You know, so I could delay when I wash my dishes. I never use it because I have no incentive to use it. Why would I run my dishwasher in the middle of the night? But if I had an incentive and someone said, you know, you know, I'll give you a rebate every time you push that button, why would I do that? So to understand the cost of electricity, we have to understand the cost of generation. And this is kind of an interesting, it's, it's a little hard to see, so just kind of look at the trends. You don't have to look at the real numbers. <coughs> um, but what we have across the top is, this is a typical utility. They have a nuclear power plant. They have coal, 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 coal. So this is becoming more expensive as it goes to the right. Gas, coal, gas, oil, gas, oil. So all their peak loads, the oils, are all on this side. And then this is the utility incremental fuel cost. So you can see that the dollar per megawatt hour, the nuclear plant is seven dollars per megawatt hour. The next cheapest is coal, which is fourteen dollars per megawatt hour. So it's twice as expensive as nuclear. And then so then we go from seven dollars per megawatt hour for the nuclear all the way up to sixty-four dollars for the peak oil. So order of magnitude difference. So what we want to do is we don't want to be operating at peak, right? That's order of magnitude more. We want to be operating somewhere down in there. And so what we want to do is we want to have economic price incentives for people to do that. So what I like to think is this is the perfect storm of time in terms of the smart grid. We have plug-in vehicles. I haven't talked much about that. I hear it well here in a minute. We have sustainable energy. We have the move towards what would be essentially, whoops, wrong way, you know, on our incremental fuel cost, free, free electricity if we could use it. And power electronics, which enables us to control with very fine control of the electricity. So let's think about what the components of the smart grid are. So first of all, we want to be able to allow seamless integration of renewable energy sources like wind, solar. We want to have a new era of consumer choice. Just like you can choose which airline you go on, you can choose which movie time you go to. You know, it depends. If you want to, you know, spend some, some money, you can go see the afternoon, you know, the evening show. We want to exploit the use of green building standards, right, to improve our electrical efficiencies. We want to make use of solar energy 24 hours a day. So if we use solar energy 24 hours a day, what do we need? We need large scale energy storage for reality. Right, that's kind of the holy grail. That's one thing that we have not yet achieved is having wide-scale energy storage. And then the last thing is enabling nationwide use of plug-in hybrid <coughs> electric vehicles. Now the thing that we think about, so I just said, if we want to make solar widely usable, we need energy storage. What do we have in our electric vehicles? Batteries. We could some of you have heard the, the term of V to G or vehicle to grid. We could use our electric vehicles as a widespread distributed bulk energy storage. Now, how might that work? Well, obviously, we charge our vehicles at night. And what do we know about the time of, of use rates for nights? Very low, right? So we could charge our batteries at night, use that cheap energy, and then, if possible, during the day, we could discharge that energy back into the grid, if our battery was large enough, and make a profit. So what would this require? Well, first of all, this would require energy storage that had good round-trip efficiencies. We're not there yet. 
getting closer. But it would also enable us a way to be able to take advantage of that. For example, I could drive my car, which I've charged up, and I'm going to the airport, for example. So I go to the airport, I pull in, I plug in, I swipe my credit card, I type in when I'm going to be back. So now I have turned over my battery in my car to you know, the airport or whoever is going to be in charge of it, and now they can charge and discharge my car. And they can be my aggregator, they can be my bidder. And now I come back and I have a credit on my credit card because I've given over control of my battery. And you could even do this down to smaller increments where I go to the mall, for example. I'm only going to be there three hours, but, but who knows? Maybe in those three hours, I might be able to get some money. At least, you know, cover the cost of my parking in the garage. So there's a lot of things there, but that requires, that requires economics, that requires, you know, aggregation, that requires communication. And another thing that we haven't really talked about is, is safety and protection. Currently, um, current distribution systems are designed to be one direction. All of the protection is designed to be one direction, from the substation down to the source, right? And that's how we determine where we have faults, how we clear those faults. If we get a large amount of generation down at the distribution or at the load level, and it's backfeeding, our protection schemes no longer work. So that's another area, is we're going to have to rethink how we do protection and safety in distribution systems. Okay, so let's talk about renewable energy. So this is renewable energy production by state. You can see Northwest, that's mostly hydro. One thing I like to point out is Missouri. Hey, we're doing pretty good in terms of renewable energy. But then I always ask people, well, what, what kind of renewable energy does Missouri have? Biomass. Missouri is forested, so we burn wood. But it's a renewable energy. So people need to start thinking outside the box. It's not just wind and solar. Same thing with like Nebraska and Iowa, ethanol, you know, that's, that's what they have is their renewable energy. Okay, so let's talk about wind. So here the major wind that we have in the United States is, is down from the Great Plains, right? So we could potentially harvest a lot of our wind energy. But one problem that we have with that is this is the United States distribution and transmission grid. There's the wind. There's the transmission grid. What's the problem? Well, there is no transmission. <laughs> so in order for us to be able to take advantage of all of that wind, we need to get transmission into into the Great Plains area, which is a big investment in dollars. And here we have, of course, our solar, which I think we all pretty well understand. Obviously down in the whole Arizona region, lots of solar energy. And of course we have nuclear. And so I think, like I said, you know, there is no one silver bullet. We're not going to get away from coal anytime soon, but we can start thinking about how we can use it as a mechanism to gracefully move from, from one, you know, one thing to another. And certainly we have to move away from using petroleum. So I think that that's, I'm out of time, so I don't really get much of a chance to talk about um, some of the work that I've done. But we can talk about that later if you want to. But I think I tried to lay the groundwork for the whole smart grid, and really it's a, it's a wide open field, and I would be very excited if I were a young person right now about all of the potential that we have moving forward. And really, you know, I think that we're going to see things. I think standing here in 20 years, I mean, you know, if I were to look at the power grid now and 20 years ago, not a whole lot of difference. Sitting here now and 20 years in the future, I think there will be a big difference. So anyway, I'll open the floor for questions.
hands. I worked, um, unfortunately I didn't get a chance to talk about this too much, I've done quite a bit of work for the military and looking at their forward operating bases and um, what they have as an issue is trying to minimize the amount of diesel that they bring into forward operating bases because of IEDs and military and all that kind of stuff. So we've looked at integrating uh, different kinds of renewable energy and energy storage. We've been looking at many different kinds of energy storage um, as a means to minimize the amount of diesel that has to be uh, brought into forward operating bases. So what kind of energy storage is the most promising for that? It's hard to say what's most promising. Um, that's one thing about energy storage is that it all has its, its advantages and disadvantages. One thing that we've looked at extensively, first of all, Rolla is we're only about 20 miles from Fort Leonard, which is a, a very large army base. And so we have done a number of um, installations at Fort Leonard with a vanadium redox flow batteries. They are good uh, storage, bulk storage, um, but not so good for mobile applications because they, they take a big footprint. Um, but they have very high efficiencies, very high round trip efficiencies. They're up around 85%, which I think is extremely good. Um, um, but yeah, like you, but, you know, like you said with lithium, though, it is, um, well, one thing also about the native redox is you know exactly what your, your state of charge is. Um, with many kinds of batteries, you don't know what your state of charge is. You have to kind of figure it out externally. Um, lithium has very uh, uh, narrow temperature bounds that it can be used at. It's not very good for um, you know extreme environments, but but it's very good for some other things. Uh, you know, so lead acid. I mean, seriously, lead acid batteries are probably one of the best energy storage types that we have. Um, they're robust, they're cheap, um, they are pretty much fully recyclable anymore. Uh, they're just heavy. You know, that's, that's the biggest disincentive of lead acids. So, you know, when, when you're talking about, especially when we talk about smart grid, and we're talking about bulk storage, you need to keep your an open mind. Um, now, if you talk about energy storage for, for vehicles, of course, then then you do have to start thinking about, you know, um, lithium air, lithium ion, all of those different kinds of technologies. So, yeah. So, uh, going back to your uh, analogy to the internet versus um, mainframes. Mm -hmm. um, in the days of mainframes, uh, there were an issue with viruses and, and security. Uh, so, well, what are the issues here? Um, all of the same. I mean, uh, once we have a fully integrated electricity system, what that means is it means I could, you know, I have a, a PV panel on my roof. I could sell it to you directly, you know. We could go on eBay, you know, I could sell it to the highest bidder. But what it also means is that, um, you know, some teenager who just broke up with his girlfriend can get on there and turn off their family's decrease, you know. Um, so there are going to be many of the same security issues that we had before. There's going to be people stealing electricity. Uh, right now, if you want to steal it, you, could, you have to go run the wire, but, but in the future you can steal electricity just by you know, programming it in, just the same way we steal people's information. There's also been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, well, one way that they find, for example, marijuana grows is because of high electricity usages. Um, but you, but, I mean, even above and beyond that, there are issues of finding out interpersonal information about people about the kind of you know, energy use that they have now that that energy use is, is going to be widely distributed. You know, I may find out that you like certain kinds of food based on you know, how you use your, you know, and, and that may not be a big deal, but there are maybe certain things that you don't want people to know that, that we may not be able to find based on energy use. Yeah? I thank you for your uh, good talk. I'm um, what's the potential for, um, is there a possibility of an increase in the number of uh, citizens, people who are totally off the grid as a bank loan? So there is no way, I mean, I can imagine people with large areas with the um, advances in technology, you set up your own battery, your own solar cell, your own wind, um, wind system, just totally set together. Like, is there a high probability of that to occur? Yes and no. Um, in order to be totally off-grid, 
you have to have space. And the majority of us live in a town where we don't have that kind of space. Um, four megawatts takes about an acre or more um, of just full coverage of, of total takes. And most of us don't have that, more, more wind turbines. You'd also have to have your own energy storage. Um, it will become more and more possible. I mean, the energy management systems are out there. Um, but one thing, you know, because a lot of people find this very attractive to live off grid. Um, but I think people also have to realize that then energy management becomes your own issue. Are we willing to forego having five televisions? Are we willing to forego, you know, having all of our computers plugged in all the time? I mean, really, the, the greenest, the greenest watt is the watt that we don't use. Um, one thing that people don't talk about that they really should talk about is conservation. You know, not using electricity. And that seems to have really much fallen by the wayside. Um, so I, my, my bottom line is if you are in town, you will never be able to be off grid. Because you just don't have the space. Couldn't you see um, some small companies uh, emerging where instead of just one or two electric companies, there's hundreds of thousands of where a right, person may buy 10 acres and sell in a local area. Um, right. I mean, that's always possible. Um, and there are people out there who are, you know, just like going to a farmer's market, who are willing to pay more for, um, you know, a certain kind of electricity that they know is, is produced in a certain way. Um, I know even in St. Louis that, you know, that they have, you know, green power that you can, but you have to pay more for it. And, but some people will altruistically pay more because they know that they're, they're using green, green energy. Um, you know, and that's, that's what this is going to open up. You know, it's like eBay. You can go on and you could buy power from whoever you wanted to. You know, it's like buying organic food. You know, if you're willing to pay more, you can buy organic food. But, you know, we are now on the same distribution system. That's, that's the issue here, the same distribution system. You have this clean power coming in, and you have this traditional power coming in. And the electrons don't know that they're any different. They're not little green electrons and you know, little black electrons. They all come on the same way. So, um, but yeah, there's no reason we couldn't do that. It's a general question. What is the main challenge to design a microgrid for, for music applications? Because I've also very large microgrid. Size. Size and weight. From origin. Size and weight. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, energy management. Um, you know, when you design, but it, it's just the military, but, but we could talk about any kind of, of microgrid. You know, but with the military, because of their, their structure, I can say you are a. Um, you know, a non-necessary load. I'm just going to drop you. you know, with the military, you can do that. When you have soldiers, you just say, "Too bad, you can't, you can't watch a movie today because you don't have enough electricity." That's much harder to do in, in society. Even though we do, we have rotating blackouts all the time. You know, that pisses people off. But, but that's that's. So do they usually think of like a mobile type microgrid, which they put on the desert or something? Yeah, well, I'll just quickly run through what we did, is we were talking about they wanted um, uh, portability requirements. And so we designed something that was essentially, I call it a Lego module. You just have these modules and then you, for scalability, how do you connect them together, and what you put in a module, um, things like that. So yeah, so that's where we came up with, with that. But it is, it's quite weight and size. The model graph you showed them, they say for renewable energy, they uh, generate the renewable energy actually hasn't been changed much over the past uh, 10 or 100 years. How do you actually run down it? It was all pushed on renewable energy, what's the main factor to that? Preventing it actually gets harmed. Well, it's hard to say. The main factor is um, placement. You know, uh, you know, a lot of people are very interested in renewable energy right now. Um, 
but as you saw, you know, where the graphs are, where you want it is not necessarily where it's available. Um, secondly, like I said, Missouri, it is far more expensive. My pain bath for installing renewable energy in my house is so long because my coal-based electricity is so cheap. Um, you know, so there, there's economic reasons, there are technological reasons. Um, and, and pretty soon there's going to be logistical reasons. Um, for example, most wind turbines have permanent magnets in them, which use rare earth metals. You know, those are becoming, you know, that's going to be, that's going to be the next petroleum is, you know, is we have to get these rare earth metals from third world countries. You know, and, and well, and, and China has a lot of these rare earth metals, but South America, Russia, um, and so if we want to keep relying on wind turbines, you know, that's, going to be, that's going to be an issue. Uh, solar voltaic panels right now are about as cheap as they're going to be. Ma the manufacturing process is about as cheap as it can possibly be at this point. Um, so the next uh, development there is, is really it's going to be going to amorphous technologies, it's going to be increases in, in materials. I mean, a lot of these issues that we're waiting on are materials issues. Energy storage, the materials issue. Um, Photovoltaics, materials issue. Um, you know, power electronics, materials issue. Need more? All right. Thank you very much.